Hey everyone, welcome back to another build log of the DIY Dyson Lamp, the series where I'm attempting to recreate the Dyson light cycle using 3D printed and off the shelf components. In the last build log, I shared my concept for a more approachable variant of the DIY Dyson you can build in just an afternoon, the DIY Dyson Express. Today, I'm diving right back into the full fledged version of the DIY Dyson, complete with custom electronics, a high powered LED chip, and a custom cooling solution. One of the inspirations for the DIY Dyson Express stems from my dissatisfaction with the current wiring solution. And while the DIY Dyson Express is one way around that problem, as a final solution, I feel it's a bit of a cop-out. So in this build log, I want to face that problem of wiring directly and see what I can do to overcome it. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of things I like about the drag chain solution. It's relatively low-tech, cheap, easy to make, and I even like the industrial aesthetic that it adds to the lamp. At the same time, there are a couple of areas where I think the drag chain could be improved. First, the overall look and tidiness of the drag chain varies a lot with the lamp's position. The clean and tidy look you see when the lamp is raised and extended quickly unravels when you lower and retract the arm. I'm pretty confident we could improve this by optimizing the characteristics of the chain links themselves and perhaps by refining the connection between the drag chain and the carriage. There's also an issue around durability. The PLA material I'm using is a little soft and as a result, Mine is showing signs of wear. Granted, I have been moving my prototype all around my office and I've definitely done things like drop the full weight of the horizontal arm right on the drag chain. But even so, I would want to make sure that the final version can withstand normal day-to-day -day abuse. Future iterations of the drag chain would use a more durable filament or maybe a different manufacturing process altogether like SLA printing in resin maybe. I don't have a resin printer, but you know, I'm just dreaming here. Finally, there's the issue around ease of assembly and access. In its current state, installing and managing the drag chain is not easy or fun. Within this drag chain, there's just one long continuous cable, which by itself dictates a very rigid and fussy assembly process that must happen in a very specific order. Once the drag chain is installed, all of the connected parts become tightly integrated, almost like they're one long singular component. Connected parts become time consuming and frustrating to access and swap out. And in turn, this discourages tinkering and iteration, which for me is a a very bad problem. An improved version of the current drag chain would decouple itself from the parts around it, and I'd likely start by splitting the cable into two or more shorter sections. This is a task that I think is totally doable, and actually it sounds to me like a lot of fun. So I've been thinking a lot about this issue of tidiness. For me, the problem boils down to the unavoidable reality that while the cable length is fixed, the distance it spans is inherently dynamic. And what happens when there's a big delta between the ideal cable length and the actual cable length? is a bunch of excess slack that has nowhere to hide. An ideal solution would be some sort of magical cable whose relationship to any connected component is somehow responsive to the lamp's position. And I wonder if that magical dynamic cable might look something like this. I'm calling this experimental component the Super Track. It's a 44 centimeter long PCB with exposed copper traces, and it's designed to nest perfectly inside the DIY Sins rails. I feed power in one end and tap into that power anywhere along the rail using a pair of BOGO pens like these. The two surface traces are exactly 2.54 millimeters apart center to center. This aligns them perfectly with off-the-shelf BOGO pen assemblies like this one where the tips of the spring-loaded contacts are also 2.54 millimeters apart. In theory, with a super track in each axis, I can transfer power between the rails through a set of BOGO pens mounted on the carriage. Through this solution, the length of the connection is essentially dynamic and the fixed length PCB can stay neatly tucked away in the rails at all times. I'm really excited to test out the SuperTrack solution, but before I do that, I need to disassemble the DIY Dyson, and before I do that, I have something really cool that I wanna show you. A viewer named Jake Brownson reached out to me a few months back and generously offered his CNC milling services. Jake totally came through with this beautiful carriage milled from aluminum, complete with tapped holes for both the belt clip and the drag chain clips on both sides. Jake did such a flawless job with this that I had to show it off before I modify the carriage to make it compatible with the Super Track. I am blown away by Jake's generosity and skill, and I feel really lucky to have talented and generous folks like Jake in our community. If you like stuff like this, check out Jake's Instagram, which is in the description. Uh, thanks again, Jake. I really appreciate your help with this. All right, as sad as it is to send Jake's beautiful carriage into early retirement, I'm going to need to alter the carriage design to accommodate the Super Track solution. First, I'll mount the Super Track within the aluminum rails. I've added a mounting hole at either end of the PCB, and for now I'm using a modified version of the lamp base with this little extension tab to accept an M2 screw and secure the tracks in place. With the tracks in place, I can move on to a component that I've been really looking forward to designing. I need to fix the pogo pin pairs in these exact positions so that they're in perfect alignment with their corresponding traces while also wiring them to each other and securely attaching them to the carriage. If I can, I want to make this pogo pin assembly easier to install, remove, and replace than the drag chain ever was. 
And beyond that, I really like the current design of the carriage, so this component should be as minimal and visually unobtrusive as possible to preserve the look of the carriage. I think what gets me so excited about this component is that I often find that under the pressure of rigid constraints like these, what tends to emerge is a solution that feels sort of natural and inevitable, like you're just chipping away at the problem to reveal the single best solution underneath. I really like problems like this. I've narrowed in on this single continuous clip that wraps around the edge of the carriage and houses both sets of pogo pins, and can then be screwed directly to the carriage like this. The pins are friction fit in the ends of the clip, and will be held permanently in place by the pressure of the super track itself. Because of this, the pen assemblies need to be inserted from the outside like this ultimately, which makes the assembly process a tiny bit tedious, and it involves soldering wires to one set of pins, inserting that into the clip with the wires threaded through, threading the wires through the other end, soldering those wires to the other set of pins, and then finally seating the pins in place. I wonder if we can somehow clean up this exposed wire though. In my next iteration, I replaced the individual pinholes for a single cavity, and that allowed me to twist the wires together post-soldering, and effectively shorten the wires before inserting the second pogo pin assembly. The wires are a bit tidier, but I think we can do better. My next 10 or so iterations focus on hiding the wires as much as possible in a hidden channel that I added to the bottom of the clip. Among the variations, my favorite solution is this open channel where you can tuck a pair of twisted wires and then retain them with an M2 screw. Later iterations did replace this screw with built-in supports, but this solution requires careful and tedious threading of the wires, both on first installation and then also on any future adjustments, so I'm sticking with the screw method for now. Man, this is a really fun part to work on. I've spent a full weekend at my desk just sketching new concepts and printing and testing the prototypes. In fact, I've been so absorbed in working on this part that I didn't stop to consider my order of operations. Here I am obsessing over the tiniest of details on a secondary component of the SuperTrack concept, and I don't even know if that concept is even remotely viable. I think I need to take a step back, pause the iteration on the Pogo Clip design, and do some initial testing of the hypothesis that a pin and a track solution can actually power the DIY sin. So I'll take what I have and assemble the lamp and test it out, and right away I'm getting a lesson in why I should test my hypotheses before getting lost in attractive details. This solution clearly isn't working at this point, and right now I don't even know why. It could be the position of the pins, it could be the types of pins that I'm using, the PCB design, the clip I spent so much time designing, or an underlying flaw in my electronics. It even may be that the pin and track solution isn't viable at all. To find out what the problem is, I need to eliminate some variables for my setup. Testing the SuperTrack solution and all of its variables all at once like this makes it really difficult to identify and isolate problems. So what I'm going to do is build a little test rig which eliminates as many of these irrelevant variables as possible. I'm cutting the number of axes, super tracks, and pogo pins in half, and going to a single track setup with a simplified carriage where I can easily mount, reposition, and swap out pogo pin configurations. The goal here is to test the underlying hypothesis that a pin and track solution is viable. If I can't get consistent power delivery using this rig, there's no way I'll be able to do it on the actual lamp. To get there, I'm going to try three things that I hope will improve connection quality. First, establish better contact between the pins and the track. Second, I'll add a capacitor which should electronically compensate for some of the power fluctuations that we're seeing. From what I understand, a capacitor can function as sort of an energy buffer within a circuit, storing energy and then releasing it to compensate for momentary power loss. And that sounds like exactly what we need. And third, I want to try out some different pin styles like this 2x2 array or these wider roller style pins and see if that helps. Let's start by making sure the pins are making consistent contact with the track. I'm using my adjustable pin setup to move the tips of the pins significantly closer to the track. I've also noticed that the SuperTrack PCB has a slight valley in the middle of the rail. It's not something you can really see, but the middle of the board is about 0.7 millimeters lower than it is at either end. I'm using this grid pattern that I printed on the back of the PCB to align and attach some 3D printed support blocks, which will hopefully fix the sagging. And with the blocks installed, the depth across the length of the super track is much more consistent, going from a difference of 0.7 millimeters down to just 0.05 millimeters. Nice. All right, so let's see if these changes result in any improvements. Okay, so it seems that rather than a slight performance improvement, the reliability problems are completely gone. That's good, I guess. Uh, turns out that poker position matters a lot. Uh, but I kind of had some other improvements that I wanted to test and now the problem I was looking to solve is gone. All right, no need to panic. I can create my own problems. So first, let's reintroduce the variable of the second axis. 
I want to see if our success translate to this two axis setup. And if it doesn't, then we've opened up an opportunity to test the other improvements. The setup for the next experiment will use two axes and two super tracks, along with a modified version of the carriage where I can mount my adjustable pin assemblies. I also want to change the way that I measure the test output. In the single axis setup, the output of the experiment was just the visible status of the LED. This is not only imprecise, but it's also difficult to do analysis on after the fact. And so I think we should ditch the DIYs and electronics for a standalone cutie pie. What I can then do is feed a three volt signal into the base of the first vertical rail, which will run up into the pogo pins, down the horizontal track, and into the analog input of the cutie pie. From here, I'll just monitor the voltage level over time and record the results. What I hope to learn here is whether or not reinforcing the super track and moving the pins closer to it is enough to give us 100% reliable power delivery across both axes. If it is, great, we're done. But if it isn't, I wanna find out what we can do to make the super track perform as well as a traditional wire. And yeah, this is really cool. Looking at the chart, I can see that while moving the axes strictly linearly back and forth or up and down, we almost never deviate from that target three volt signal. But outside of that, what I'm seeing are periodic dips in the graph where the connection is compromised. The cause of these dips is actually pretty interesting because it's a new rotary motion that's introduced when the leverage generated by lifting up on the end of the arm causes the arm to rotate around its axis, which is located at the carriage. And because the arm and the carriage can move independently, when the arm rotates, the carriage doesn't and it throws the two components and our pogo pins out of alignment. We lose connection and the voltage dips. But I wonder if some of our other planned solutions might help us solve this problem. I wanna test this somewhat systematically, so I'd like to try an experiment using three types of pins, both with and without a capacitor, and then compare the results. There's three basic types of movements that tend to cause these voltage drops. The short lift, the full lift, and the lift and turn. For each configuration within this experiment, I'll perform each of these movements 10 times and save the output. At the beginning of each test, I'll hold down this button, which cuts the power to the analog input completely, so I know exactly when the test started and when it ended, and I can avoid including irrelevant data points. I'm really just looking for directional feedback here, so if I need to come back later and do a more precise experiment, I can do that. Uh, as far as analyzing the data, I was initially tempted to just take the reported voltage over the course of the test, average it out, and use that to score each solution. Uh, but I actually don't think that's such a good idea. Um, for one, I'm not really controlling for the duration of the test. And since I'm pulling the voltage uh, once every 100 milliseconds, a test that runs a second too long could generate an additional 10 data points and that could really throw out the average. Beyond that, what I'm looking for is more like catastrophic failure here. So the average doesn't really tell me that much. Instead, what I think I'm gonna do is count the number of times the voltage dips below a set threshold and simply score the test based on that. And, and then I can add a little bit of extra detail by calculating the average distance from that target voltage that occurred during the dips, because that's an average that I do care about. So I've gone and broken down the results of the 18 tests into six charts, one for each type of pogo pin, both with and without the capacitor. Each chart has the three movements on the vertical axis, so the short lift, the long lift, and the lift and turn. The bars in yellow are the total number of dips between the 2.8 volts, and the gray bars are the average size of those dips. Looking at this data, I see a couple of trends. So first is that none of the tests produced the flawless results that I'm looking for to emulate the performance of a cable. So I do need to continue improving the solution no matter what. Second, looking at the difference between the charts on the left versus the charts on the right, it's obvious that adding a capacitor really helps. Uh, regardless of the pen type. And lastly, while the choice of pin doesn't really seem to matter between the two by one and the two by two pins, so like adding redundant pins doesn't seem to help, the roller style pin really underperformed based on what I was expecting. Um, and I hadn't really thought about this until now, but this could be to the, due to the fact that even though the roller pin has a larger diameter and more surface area, what's called the stroke distance, which is the total distance that the pen can travel, that's actually shorter. And if that is the problem, that's consistent with our problem of the carriage and the arm physically pulling away from each other. Because if you have a shorter stroke length, um, they're going to pull away from each other sooner and the pogo pin won't extend to meet the rail. 
This is just a hypothesis, but I could test this further if I found some additional pogo pins that had a longer stroke length um, and test those to see if that improves it. All right, so that was a pretty good test. And looking back on everything that we've done so far, I think there are a couple interesting findings. First is that the pogo and track solution does seem to be in theory possible. Um, and it may even work as a cable replacement on the DIY sim, so that's pretty cool. The next conclusion is that the pin position does seem to matter a lot, and that's both the distance from the track and the alignment of the pins to the track. Uh, so we'll have to be careful of that going forward. The pin surface area and pin redundancy don't really seem to help much, but stroke distance might. Fourth, capacitor helps a lot. The fifth finding is that strictly linear motion, so back and forth, up and down, uh, doesn't really seem to matter that much, but as soon as you introduce rotational motion, uh, that seems to be a big problem um, where the arm separates from the carriage. So we have to watch out for that. And last, contact between the pins and the vertical super track doesn't ever really seem to be a problem. Like, I guess just physically there isn't a case where those two parts tend to separate. So that's really good. With these findings in mind, a potential solution is starting to kind of take shape in my mind, which involves moving the pen assembly that's touching the horizontal arm and affixing that to the arm itself rather than to the carriage. The thinking here is that the pen assembly and the track, instead of moving independently from one another, are now bound to each other and will always stay in perfect alignment, just like Frodo and Smeagol. Thinking back to the light cycle, I've always wondered why this power clip is attached to the horizontal arm rather than attached to the carriage, and I'm beginning to wonder if this is why but I'll keep an eye on those things as I continue iterating. In upcoming build logs, I'll experiment with ways to make the track and pin solution 100% reliable. All right, outside of the super track, I've made two other notable updates since the last build log. First, I removed all instances of embedded nuts and heat set threaded inserts on the lamp, specifically in the carriage belt clip and the counterweight. Not only were the threaded inserts a chore to install, but they added an extra bit of expense, and I found that they just weren't necessary in these cases. I know this because more often than not, I actually used the carriage belt clip without any screws at all, and it worked just fine. I've also updated the counterweight design to streamline it a bit and increase the usable internal volume. To do this, I relocated the belt clip to the rear of the counterweight, which in turn requires a slight redesign to the clip. I'm not sure if I prefer the look of this design over the previous one, but I definitely appreciate the extra space inside. All right, I think that's all the updates for this build log. I do have a new side project planned for the next video that I think some of you are really gonna like, so keep an eye out for that in the coming weeks. And until then, take care and thanks for watching. See ya.